Great. So today's webinar is brought to you by Socially Determined. Socially Determined is an MHPA silver partner and a longtime supporter of MHPA and our members. We thank them for organizing today's session titled Leveraging SDOH in Social Risk Data and Analytics to Improve Member Outcomes and Enhance Plan Performance. I'm excited to welcome and introduce today's speakers, Elizabeth Starr, Product Director of SDOH and Community Partnerships at Emma, and Ashley Perry, Chief Strategy and Solutions Officer at Socially Determined. With that, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Ashley. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. We're really excited about this conversation. Um, thanks also to Elizabeth uh, and the entire team at Aetna, both for your broader partnership with us in doing this work and for participating in the webinar this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Um, so a couple of things to start. Wanted to walk everyone through the agenda of what we hope to cover in the next hour starting with just a very high level um, level set around the changing SDOH landscape as we see it here at Socially Determined and through the, the lens of the work that we are doing with leading payers, providers, life sciences companies, and other organizations um, in the broader healthcare ecosystem um, that are really leading the way on a lot of this work. Um, Want to talk specifically about the incredible work that Elizabeth's team at Aetna is doing taking social risk data and analytics and really embedding it into their strategy around member um, outcomes, equity, recruitment, retention, engagement, et cetera. And I'll let Elizabeth talk a lot more about that. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit in just an open forum about some of the things that we've learned through this joint partnership over the last several years that we think would be beneficial for this group to hear. Um, do wanna talk a little bit about redetermination in the Medicaid space specifically, because we know that that's top of mind for a lot of organizations out there today in the Medicaid space. Um, and then most importantly, we promise that we will leave some time for Q&A. So we do hope that you will send questions into the chat along the way, and we'll take them as they come in, but we'll also make sure that we have some time at the end to address those questions as well. So with all of that said, um, why don't we go ahead and dive in. Wanted to start this conversation with a little bit of a level set around the evolving SDOH landscape and specifically some of the things that we've seen um, from socially determined perspective, as well as from the perspective of the organizations that we're partnering with um, in this space. With all of that said, I wanted to start with just two numbers to frame the discussion. Um, the first, the 90 number that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, that is the average number of minutes that an adult American spends in a clinical care setting in a given year. And the 525,000 number on the right-hand side is the rest of the minutes that are available in the year. Um, so recognizing that it's a very small portion of most of our lives that we spend in clinical settings, and yet historically we as an industry have used the data that's gathered in those clinical encounters to drive the way that we manage care, that we try and um, manage risk, that we try and improve outcomes, that we try and advance equity for the populations in the community that we serve. Um, and so it's just, it's a very limited view uh, and starting point uh, to try and do that effectively. And so with that in mind, it's socially determined our view and our, our goal really through our data and our analytics and our solutions is to be able to open the aperture for the payers, the providers, the risk bearing entities that we work with to be able to bring to bear um, social risk data and insights that can complement the data that they already have within their enterprise systems whether that's their, their claims files, whether it's your EHR, whether management system, et cetera. Um, but to be able to supplement all of that clinical uh, encounter cost utilization data with data about all of the other factors of life that impact um, the outcomes that we're trying to collectively manage. Um, and to that end, we have seen no shortage of impact as we've done this work over the last several years with many organizations on social risk on utilization cost outcomes equity um, in the healthcare space. On the slide here, you see just a couple of the many, many data points that support this. Um, but we know, for example, that up to 45% of US households have faced significant financial problems. That's historical data, but it's become even more true um, following the pandemic and some of the economic uncertainty that stemmed from it. We see consistently that up to 20% of households are reporting um, housing insecurity. 
Um, we have almost a third of our fellow Americans struggling with low health literacy skills, um, and the list goes on and on. Um, and so the unfortunate thing that's true is that there's no shortage of social risk, need, and impact. Um, but there is an opportunity for us all collectively to leverage data and an analytics first approach to both understand that risk and need across the communities and populations that we're serving, as well as address it in a data-driven and equitable way. Um, and that's a lot of the journey that we've been on with the Aetna team and um, the work that we've done with lots of other partners across the country in this space. How do we actually do that? So just a couple of um, minutes on our actual approach at Socially Determined. Um, really importantly, we look at both community level SDOH risk exposure. So when we're talking about that, think about assets, infrastructure, resources within a given community that influence all of the residents within that community. In addition, we recognize that there are person and family specific factors that can actually help mitigate or accelerate the community level risk that residents face. And so to that end, we've built proprietary analytic models that look at both the community level risk exposure for the entire United States, as well as patient or member level social risk factor scores or risk exposure at the individual level. On the community side, if you look on the left hand side of the screen, you see all of the different domains that we look at today. So it's things like the economic climate, the housing environment, health literacy and social connectedness again, all at a community level. And for the entire country, we've built uh, risk models that assess that at a really precise resolution. So sub county, uh, sub zip code, in some cities like uh, DC where I am today and where we're based, it's actually sub block. So it gives you really precise insights into where we're seeing a concentration of risk and need across these different domains and across your entire market. And then in addition for your entire patient or member population, we can generate risk scores as well um, that help inform not just the risk score that you might face based on where you live, but also in light of your personal context. Um, and so on that side, on the right hand side of this, the slide, you see the individual level domains that we have across those five areas today. We are currently working on building on building out companion scores around digital access and literacy, as well as social connectedness at the individual level as well. So it gives you the ability to see um, consistently, efficiently, and equitably uh, concentration of risk and need for your entire market, as well as which segments of your member population or attributed lives face elevated risk across these different domains. And all of that is designed to tee up a data-driven and analytics-first strategy to help inform the investments that you're making in mitigating those social risks and social needs for your members um, that allows you to be able to um, improve outcomes, manage risk effectively, and advance equity all at scale. How do we actually deliver this um, to our customers like Aetna? Um, there's a couple of different ways. So we have um, an analytic platform called Socialscape that allows you to visualize the community risk um, as well as member level risk in a dynamic way. Um, so think of this as a strategic decision support tool that your team can use to be able to make more informed decisions. And then in addition, and really importantly, we also provide data feeds that you can integrate into your enterprise uh, data sets uh, and data systems. So that could be your care management platform, your pop health management tool, your EHR, et cetera. But it gives you a way to take our data insights um, and actionable intelligence around social risk and embed it into your enterprise systems as well as access it through the social state platform. So um, with all of that said, just a couple of, of final caveats just based on our work in the space over the last several years and the conversations that we've had with teams um, like Aetna and leaders like Elizabeth, the reason why we think that all of this is helpful to those organizations and teams is that um, data collection around SDOH is difficult, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and really importantly, it's also often inequitable. Um, if we're using only strategies like, for example, screening to collect data around members' needs, where we know that we're systematically missing a subset of our members um, and therefore not able to include them in the analysis and the, the strategies. 
Second piece is it's really difficult in a lot of the systems that exist today to be able to connect that community level data that I talked about with person level data. And so part of the way that we've built the social state platform is intentionally designed to do that in a way that allows teams to look at where are you seeing a concentration of risk at the community level? Where do you have a concentration of your members? And then what are those members individual social risk factors and how do you put all of that together in an integrated view that allows you to make the best possible decisions around how you invest and intervene to mitigate those SDOH and uh, social needs. And then the final piece of this is that um, there are a lot of publicly available data sets that do this work. Um, we think a lot of them are great. We incorporate a lot of them into the social state platform, um, but a lot of them are um, perhaps a little bit too blunt to be actionable. So they might tell you which segment of your market to focus on. Um, they might even directionally tell you which segment of your population to focus on, but they don't tell you with specificity what action to take. And we think that's really important. So it's not just who to focus on and where to focus on, but also what specific investments can you make from an intervention perspective that are going to be most effective at mitigating risk for that community and for that segment of your member population. And so I'll talk more a little bit about that as we get into it, but our risk scores and models, both on the community side and on the member side are intentionally designed to be able to, to serve up that next best action from the intervention perspective. Okay, so with all of that said about SD, I would love to turn it over to Elizabeth to talk a bit about, from Aetna's perspective, why did you get into this space in the first place? What have you done with the data that we've been able to, um, to share with you? And then how is your team, really importantly, um, acting on that data in a way that's having an impact both for your, your members and for your overall business? Great, thanks so much, Ashley. Um, Aetna has been very excited about the partnership with Socially Determined, and I'm excited to be here today to share why social risk data is important to us. Uh, so to kick us off, I want to share a little bit about the department and what we're doing. For Aetna Medicaid, we've created the Better Together Social Impact Solutions, where we work to simplify structures and services that help our members and achieve better health outcomes. We do this in various ways, focusing our efforts with our members and the communities where they live. So next slide, um, for today's session, I'm going to focus on one of our teams in particular, our Community Cares Team, which stands for Collaboration and Real Engagement Solutions. Essentially, their role is to identify strengths and needs of the community and build relationships in order to partner locally to replicate what is working well in other communities and address needs collaboratively if gaps are identified. A critical component of the work they do is driven by data, like what we partner with Socially Determined around. So by leveraging multiple data sets, including social risk analytics, community needs assessments, and social referral data, we can proactively identify community strengths and needs. Then we begin to embed ourselves in the community. We serve on boards of nonprofit agencies, volunteer at community-based organizations, and participate in targeted coalition meetings. This gives us a deeper understanding of the community resources and the social safety net. We learn about the available resources and about valuable organizations or programs that may be in danger of losing funding, therefore creating a gap for that community. We then begin collaborating with people, organizations, and systems. Our teams work with state and local leaders, faith-based organizations, providers, and healthcare systems school districts, food pantries, homeless shelters, and, and many other groups that serve the community. Through these collaborations, we can then create innovative programs and initiatives to fill gaps through solutions like our Community Health Council process, which utilizes CDC framework for pro program planning and evaluation. So on our next slide, I wanna just go over the, the approach um, for the team a little deeper. So our foundational approach to our program is using data-driven, human-centered solutions that meet members where they are, reducing barriers to health while continuously working to improve the collective health of the communities. We know in order for any one person, family, or community to focus on being the healthiest they can be, they must ensure that they have all basic needs met. So here's how our CARES team works. 
They focus on establishing partnerships and collaborative solutions in order to improve the health and well being of members and the communities in which they live. Data as well as feedback based on stakeholder lived experience inform the activities and the initiatives of our teams. We can then take a grassroots boots on the ground approach, ensuring that our health plans have local teams who are consistently in the community, investing their time to build strong relationships with people, organizations, and systems which impact health. They then seek to collaboratively identify innovative ways to support the social safety net through strategic outcomes-based initiatives. We can then assess and evaluate for quality improvement so that we can replicate what is working well in order to remain innovative and effective in our model. So next slide, I'm gonna focus on our community health council solution that the team uses to do the work I just described and share a practical example. When we begin to think about starting a council, we start by looking at our data to identify a community where we can make an impact. Community level social risk analytics that we leverage from Socially Determined are a key component in this data we review. While we are looking for gaps, we are also looking at the communities that do not have gaps, so we can learn from those communities too. A few examples we may hone in on are food deserts, limited access to healthy food, lack of transportation, um, or limited income. We pull the state or local community needs assessment and back it up with our social referral data the social risk analytics of our members as well through Socially Determined, and then begin to have conversations with all people, organizations, and systems that serve the community. Through the data, we can see where resources are needed. We then may notice a trend in certain communities, which brings us to mobilizing community partners. So we bring together community partners like nonprofit organizations, local hospitals, farmers markets, uh, the local school system, public health organizations, and even faith-based organizations. The team convenes and facilitates a session with these partners to look through community data, including the social risk analytics and local needs assessments. Community participants share their thoughts and experiences to build consensus on a community need and talk through what a solution may look like. Through the facilitation of our team, the group agrees on a focus area and builds a project that they'd like to focus on. This can vary based on the community needs, but may address issues like transportation, foster care, substance use, healthy food access, maternal child health, and more. The group forms a coalition to reach the goals that the community has set. Outcomes can vary based on the gap in the community. A few examples are backpack programs for students so that they have healthy food over the weekend or cooking demonstrations at the farmer's market so that families know how to cook healthy foods. We then identify a champion to pass the torch onto and co-facilitate with them to begin to transition out of the meeting as a facilitator and become a trusted partner. So lastly, I just wanna give a specific example on the next slide of how we've utilized data to identify a need in a community. So we looked at the social risk community level data in Georgia and identified Emanuel County as having many urgent needs, um, but particularly food insecurity. We knew through conversations with community-based organizations that the county had limited resources for food outlets and high rates of diabetes and obesity. So Aetna partnered with Emanuel County Family Connection and other groups locally to provide a variety of interventions. This included an evidence-based curriculum that offered nutrition education, a family reading night promoting health literacy, and a series of mini farmers markets. A very recent update for this county is that they're actually getting a true brick and mortar food pantry now that's gonna better serve their community. So this is just one example of how social risk analytics has helped us drive the work of our CARES teams. And we look forward to sharing more on what we're doing in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I, I mean, I think there's a lot that we can unpack there. Um, we've already gotten some questions in the chat. So maybe we'll spend just a few minutes talking through some of those. If you do have questions for me about socially determined and our, our social risk data and analytic approach, happy to take those in the chat. If you have questions for Elizabeth about the great work that her team at Aetna is doing to really act on those 
um, the data that we're sharing, the insights that we're generating, please send those in. Um, and I already see some really good ones. So I think we're gonna have some good candidates here. Um, one of them, um, Elizabeth, a lot of this has been um, for you, a process of building a new team to do this work, um, getting the team stood up internally, but then also forming those relationships at the community level with all of the partners that you need to bring to the table. So would love to hear you talk a little bit about what that journey has been like for Aetna internally, but then also what it has meant for the relationships that you have with those really key community partners. Sure. Um, yeah, like you, you've you shared, um, we are a, a newer team here at Aetna Medicaid and um, I'm going to kind of tag into a question that we've gotten in the chat with this too about um, how are we engaging with existing coalitions and councils um, like through the local public health departments and communities to make sure we're not duplicating existing efforts. So um, you heard me talk about a, a key component is just embedding yourself in the community and learning more about them. So the data can drive where we spend time um, and, and help us understand a community from a high level, but you really have to, to get local to understand. It's the individuals that are living and working in the communities that, that know those communities best. And so um, we've really been spending the past um, you know, time as we've been standing up the team, just getting out there in the community and meeting people. Um, it's it's you know, relationship building, um, but doing it in a consistent manner and, and showing up um, you know, consistently time after time, whether it's for meetings, um, existing coalitions and councils. So we do not want to duplicate. Um, so if there is an area that already has a council or coalition that is, um, you know, that is doing great work, then, then we'll join that coalition and council and be a part of that work as a trusted partner. Um, sometimes we learn that coalitions and councils uh, that we start partnering with, they They've, they've gotten stagnant or kind of stalled in the work. So sometimes bringing this data can start to drive some new innovations, um, which we found helpful with partnering with those local uh, councils and coalitions that already exist. Um, but we don't wanna duplicate. So um, oftentimes we're starting in areas that don't have the resources um, to have the coalitions and councils that are, are doing the meaningful work. And I think that piece about not duplicating is so critical. Um, so to be able to come in to communities, have a conversation about what's already in place, how can you be a catalyst for that work and really help it and use the data that you're bringing to the conversation as an asset uh, for the community members, but not try and build net new where there's already great stuff in, in flight, um, but really understand from a data perspective where are there additional opportunities and then how do you form partnerships or extend some of the work that's already being done to really be able to, um, to capitalize on those and, and to be able to, to move the needle forward. Um, and I think that's what something that your team has done so well um, is being able to be sensitive to that and be thoughtful about how you approach those community partners and conversations. Um, Absolutely. One, one thing too I'll just share is that if, if things are going well and there's a, a, a council that is just doing great work and um, making tremendous strides, we want to learn from them so we can share it with their neighboring counties. Um, the data helps us to look and see, oh my gosh, there's this one county and surrounding them, there's not any of the same concerns. So what are they doing that the county in the middle is not doing? And how do we bring those partners that are, are close by their, their neighboring uh, counties to, to support the work and, and try to partner with those counties as well? Yep. So I'm glad you brought that up. There's several questions that are kind of along the same theme, which is what's the reaction that you get from the local CBOs when you approach them and what have you found really works in engaging them in this kind of collaborative partnership? Yeah, I, I think a key part is um, that we hire locally. So when I talk about the CARES teams, they are local individuals that are already living in the communities that they're serving. And so oftentimes they've worked at the nonprofit that, um, that they're you know, reaching out to and beginning to partner with. Um, or they've been at the public health department. Um, I say that our, uh, our the, the CARES program, that our solutions are like um, public health and social work collided and they birthed our, our department. And so um, we've really just found that that local presence and, and hiring people that are already trusted in the community is key. Um, none of us can go into a community where we don't live and, and really start to partner in meaningful ways without you know, understanding it firsthand. Yep, yep. That makes sense. Um, a couple of other questions uh, around this kind of theme. 
One is how do you define success and measure impact? And I know this is one that we get asked mm -hmm. all the time at Socially Determined. So I will let you weigh in first and then I might have a couple of thoughts to add just based on the conversations we've had with other plans in this space. Yeah, um, well, I think the outcome-based contracts help with that because we are actually measuring our members and the impact that these interventions are having on their health. Um, you know, measuring ROI on social determinants health is, you know, you need a long runway. So as we discussed, we are a newer team. Um, so that that work is underway, um, but we're, we're looking at it from all angles that we can using our informatics teams to, to partner with us. Yeah, and I would say, in our view, that's really important um, to think about both the time horizon, right, that you're going to be doing the measurements, and then what um, measures do you think you can move in various uh, time periods. And just to give a couple examples for folks out there who are thinking through this themselves, um, one of the measures that we've looked at with a lot of our partners that's a little bit um, on the sort of shorter term time horizon is uh, member churn. Right. And so if you can look at are you able to engage members earlier in their tenure with the plan um, in a more holistic way, right, because you understand not just their clinical conditions and needs, but also the social context in which they live, does it allow you to have a more meaningful interaction with them and provide more benefit and support earlier in that relationship so that you um, sort of maximize the chance that they're going to to stay on your plan over time. Um, so that's one that you can look at that's a sort of nearer term. As you start to get into the intervention space, what's interesting is that depending on the social care intervention that we're talking about, the time horizon really varies, right? So if you think about, for example, something like medically tailored uh, meal delivery post-discharge, right? And if 30-day all cause readmissions is the metric that you're using to measure whether that intervention is successful, you can do that in a matter of months or quarters instead of quarters and years. And some of the other interventions that we've worked on, um, you know, it's just a much longer time horizon. So I think it's important to um, be candid about that upfront and be mindful of it um, in the conversations you're having internally with your teams, as well as with your community partners, and be able to identify a series of measures, some of which are sort of those more proximal ones, some of which are longer term, that will give you a sense for um, directionally, are you seeing um, encouraging signs of success here? And how can you use those um, outcomes, the early outcomes measures to indicate whether you should you know, continue to invest in certain programs if there's adjustments that need to be made to them, or potentially you think about pivoting to a different strategy. So um, it's a little bit of a nuanced approach, but it's really important to think about all of that at the outset as you start to make investments in these different uh, intervention programs and partnerships. Absolutely. Um, Elizabeth, there's so much in the chat. Are know, there any other questions that you're Yeah, no, I'm to gonna, I'm gonna just really pick good. a question and go if, okay. that, if that works. Okay, um, I love um, one question says on the county list with the risk scores that I just shared from Georgia, there were several others that had scores of fives on the individual risk factors. So how did how did we determine the best intervention to pursue? Um, so we did not. The community decided that. So that's that component where we use the data to to drive you know where we will start embedding ourselves in the community. And then by talking to those trusted partners, um, you know, they are the ones that express this is this is an urgent need for us, and we want to we want to do something about it. And so um, it was the community that decided on that intervention. Um, and then another question that kind of uh, will go into the next part of that um, says, does Aetna reimburse or fund organizations, community partners for services that address the health related social needs of their members? And so um, when we get to a solution within the, the health council process, um, there may be a need for funding or there may not be. Um, and if there is a funding need, then we come in and see how we can support. So there there's um you know can be a financial component um you know but it could not be i i referenced the the backpack program and um you know it could just be that we had the right people at the meeting uh one example is uh, having a you know the farmers market there and so um having the farmers there and understanding that gosh our our backpack program doesn't have fresh fruit and vegetables um, but that would be really easy for me and my farmer friends to plan an extra row um, and, and just donate that to the school system. So um, that doesn't take any funds from us, um, just that community collaboration and organizing. And that's been one of the most interesting 
uh, lessons learned for us at Socially Determined about the work, a lot of the plans that we're partnering with, um, when we do our, we, we generate our risk scores, right, for their full market, their full member population, identify communities and subpopulations that need specific support, often the answer is not um, that the plan themselves need to invest in providing the support, it's that they need to be the bridge connecting those communities and individuals to programs that are evidence-based, thoughtfully designed, funded through other streams, already exist, trusted partners within the community, um, and yet um, they just haven't reached those members or the segments of the community that would benefit most from them. So using data and analytics is a very effective way for plans to understand that and see it clearly for their full market, full member population, um, and then be able to make those connections to community programs, partnerships, resources, et cetera, that exist. And then what we are seeing is what naturally evolves out of that, right, are more integrated collaboration opportunities um, where there's a clear need and there's um, a clear view around how plans can work with those community partners together in an effective way. But it's easier to do that if you're able to understand from a, a data perspective, where is there the need and how does that justify the investment on the plan side as well as on the community partner side. Um, speaking of, um, I felt like there was one other question that I wanted to make sure you asked or answered. Um, oh, it was about sharing the results back or at least sharing some data back with the yep. local CBOs. So can you talk a little bit about how you guys are approaching um, providing that feedback back to your partners? Yeah, that, that's really kind of the next component. So sometimes we find more valuable than community investments is sharing that data back because it can allow our community-based organizations to leverage that those outcomes to, to get, you know, more sustainable funding. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, they are, they're looking for funding streams, whether through state funds, federal funds, um, but they don't have the resources to evaluate the impact of the services. Um, and because we're able to look at our members on that member level um, and, and look at the claims history and, and the interventions, you know, pre and post, that is, that can be very valuable data to the CBOs to share back. Sometimes more valuable than dollars. <laughs> yes. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that. One of the things that we learned early on in our work here at Socially Determined is that um, with the conversations we were having with CBOs, there were sort of two common themes and the challenges that they were facing. One was that um, the people who are being referred to their programs weren't always the right fit for it, either in terms of their actual need or eligibility. Um, and so there was an opportunity to use data and analytics to improve that proactive identification and referral process. The other piece of it was on the back end. You know, they knew that they were delivering a social care service or intervention that had the potential to really move the needle around uh, clinical utilization cost, healthcare outcomes in general, but they had no ability to combine their referral and fulfillment data with that um, claims data that would allow them to make that case. And so I think part of this work is bringing together the social risk data, the clinical and claims data, the referral data, and the fulfillment data in an integrated platform that can allow you to see uh, the impact that all of that work is having on the metrics that matter to the risk-bearing entities. Um, and so we've seen, the, I, I think, a willingness for CBOs to lean into sharing some of that data because they recognize that the ability to connect their data with your data and with social risk data is really powerful. Um, there was one or a couple of questions about sort of the risk scores themselves. So I just want to jump back to that quickly. Um, a lot of it has to do with the data that's used to build the risk scores. Um, so I should say it's a combination of uh, both open source and proprietary data sets. It's a lot of things that you would imagine. So census data, USDA data, um, HUD data, CDC data, et cetera. Um, it's also a, a, a number of different proprietary data sets that we incorporate into the platform. So just as one example, when we look at the food landscape at the community level, as well as food insecurity at the member level, one of the data elements that we incorporate into that particular risk model has to do with the density and ratio of healthy and unhealthy food sources around 
any specific location or individual. And so as part of that, we incorporate point uh, data for every you know, full service grocery store, fast food restaurant, et cetera, in the entire country. And that feeds into that distance weight calculation. So lots of different data sets out there. Um, in 2023, one of the things I can say most confidently is there's no shortage of data out there. Um, the magic is really being able to incorporate all of that data and use it to build actionable models that tell you not only where to focus, but who to focus on and what to focus on as that intervention strategy. And that's really what our models are designed to do. Um, I'll take a question. Yeah, I see okay, a question here that, that I'll do. Um, so one question was, since community members interact with healthcare providers regularly, are we working with hospitals to partner with them? to provide programs to address SDOH? And, and the answer is yes. Um, our teams, so we I talked about the external component of the CARES team, and, and that's just one of many teams within our um, social impact Better Together solutions. Um, but a, a key component is driving the work internally. So that's partnering with our provider teams, our network teams, to make sure that they're asking these questions with our providers and that they're offering support. Um, you know, some hospitals and providers have, have tons of solutions, know the resources and can connect members. And, and some are, you know, gathering the data, but don't, don't do anything with it. And so um, it's making it actionable and providing that support and resources that, um, that our CARES team has taken on internally and then partnering with those external providers through those teams. So um, we don't want anyone, you know, doing this in a vacuum and, and we want to really support, um, you know, in a holistic way. And on that note about having a more holistic approach, one of the questions asked about um, sort of the percentage of the population that is covered as part of this and, and how you think about being able to have that complete view um, for your entire member population. So I'll just add um, intentionally the way that we've designed our models, um, we're able to generate our risk scores as well as the underlying sort of drivers of risk for a very high percentage of the adult members that Aetna sends us. So it allows us to create um, a consistent view of risk and need across their entire member population without requiring any direct member engagement, interaction, communication. Um, that's really important, I think, for Elizabeth and team because it gives them you know, immediately that full picture. Um, and so they don't have to sort of uh, continuously assess based on evolving screening data. But it's also really important from an equity perspective, because we've seen systematically that some of the other strategies that a lot of organizations are using with the best of intentions, right, to assess SCOH needs for their members are things like screening. Um, but for example, if you're only screening in primary care settings, you are systematically missing this, the segment of your member population that's not connected to primary and preventive care. So it's not to say that screening is not a good strategy. We think of it here as an and, not an or, but um, I think the, the intention with the work that we do here is to be able to provide a more consistent and equitable holistic view across an entire population as a starting point for a lot of the additional um, either um, strategies around screening or um, member engagement, outreach, support, referral, et cetera. Um, and the data and analytics can provide a really nice foundation for everything that flows from there. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo on that, that, um, you know, the, the reason the community level data on top of all of our member level data is so important is because we, we want to ensure that we're meeting the needs of all of our members. So not just those, um, you know, that, that, um, you know, on, on paper look like they have the highest needs, but, but everyone, um, anyone who, um, you know, reaches out or we're able to connect with, we want to make sure that we're able to support their needs. Um, and being a Medicaid plan, we know that, that our members have needs. Um, so. So that's actually a great transition. I might, um, transition to talk for a couple of minutes about redetermination, because I know a lot of, um, plans that's top of mind right now. And then we'll still have a few minutes for general questions as well as any redetermination specific ones. Um, but just on the redetermination front, so we know that for many plans, this is a, a huge lift over the next uh, 12 months and a real um, area of focus. And so to that end, 
at Socially Determined, we spent a lot of time over the last six months talking with our plan partners and thinking about the data assets that we have within our social scape platform and trying to think through how could we leverage that data to support our plan partners in navigating this redetermination process. Um, and specifically with an eye towards helping to ensure that the members um, that are still eligible for Medicaid are able to retain their coverage, um, even if they might face some challenges navigating that redetermination process. Um, so with that goal in mind, earlier this year, we launched a new redetermination risk roster solution. So this is on top of um, all of the risk models and visualizations that we were already offering through the Socialscape platform, but really specifically with an eye towards prioritizing for plans of their full Medicaid population, which subset of those members are likely to face the greatest challenges navigating that redetermination process. And as plans start to make investments in deploying resources to support members uh, in getting through that process, which subset of the members should they focus on? Um, so to that end, we've built a, a new risk score around this. It looks at a couple of key components that we think are really um, impactful in terms of members' ability to um, get through redetermination. Um, and the key drivers here are um, ability to reach. So is the, the state Medicaid agency or are you as a plan able to reach that member? Um, do you have updated address, phone number, email, contact information in general for them? We know that a, a huge percentage of Medicaid members moved during the pandemic. Um, and so a lot of the plans that we work with do not have up-to-date contact information for them. Second piece of this is their navigational needs. So um, do they need support being able to get through the process if you are able to reach them? And that can include things like educational attainment, um, literacy skills, language spoken in the home, et cetera. Um, whether they're a caregiver, whether they have a caregiver in the home that's supporting them, all of those factors kind of influence whether they're going to need your help navigating the process or if there's someone else that can help them through that. And then the third piece is just understanding more about their household context. So if they are a single parent, if they have multiple children in the home, um, if they have other adults in the home, all of those factors can influence their ability to um, be able to navigate the process. And again, um, would inform your team around the level of support that they might need. So we think this is really important. The projections that we've seen here are that up to 40% of Medicaid members who are likely to lose coverage as a result of redetermination actually are still technically eligible for the program. Um, and it's just that they're not gonna be able to get through this process on their own. So we think there's a tremendous opportunity to leverage data um, to be able to inform your team around who are those members and how do you provide proactive support um, to be able to maintain access to care, continuous coverage, and to keep uh, your total enrollment numbers up. So if folks have more questions about that, I'm happy to talk more about it. Also happy to take any other questions that you have for Elizabeth or me about anything that we've covered before this. Um, Elizabeth, there's an interesting one about whether any of this data is feeding into some of your um, sort of broader policy uh, conversations that you're having. I don't know if you, your team has done that yet, but we'd be curious to hear your take on that in terms of the conversations that you're either having at the, the state Medicaid agency level or um, at the national level. Yeah, um, I, I mean, this work is is really key in helping, you know, our internal um, partners and our state partners understanding um, you know, what's going on in the community as we've um, been focusing on the community level today. And, um, and hearing, I, you know, the, the really neat part of it is just combining it with that local presence and voice. So um, for those that are the serving agencies of our members uh, that we're partnering with, uh, it is definitely a, a, a way for us to leverage, uh, you know, in real time data and information, um, both upstream and downstream to, to support that work. I'm just scrolling through. Um, any others that you would see that you really want to take? My goodness, the list is long. Um, <laughs> um, 
Um, I don't know if we want to touch on the um, the juvenile justice question, the um, the risk oh. looked at um, just from an educational purpose. Um, and I'm happy to to speak on on that too through our partnership. But yeah, so why don't you touch on that, and then I'll talk a little bit from the data side. But would love to have you start with that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, one thing is, um, you know, we have, um, you know, obviously indicators that, um, you know, that, that lead us to understand um, potential risks, but we are not getting individual level data on our, on our younger members in child welfare, um, just because of their age. So just wanted to, I thought it would be important to state that. And on the socially determined side, the same is true. So we um, we can look at uh, pediatric members and look at the community level risk based on where they live. We do not, though, generate individual level social risk factor scores for minors. Part of that is just a data uh, limitation issue because minors don't have things like credit history. Um, but also part of it is just recognizing that um, con consistently we're not able to get the types of data that we would want to have available to be able to generate that individual score. So a lot of the plans that we're working with have a large percentage of uh, pediatric members. And so for them, really the way that they use our community level data is thinking about the distribution of those members across their market, and then also the distribution of risk across different domains. So for example, if you're seeing that you have a concentration of your you know, pediatric members at elevated risk of food insecurity versus transportation challenges, you might think differently about the interventions and partnerships that you would prioritize for that population, but thinking about it more at that community and population level, as well as a specific uh, minor or individual. Uh, I'll take one more that I see. Uh... Uh, question was, are we leveraging technology to engage members at scale that are identified from the socially determined data? So um, I focused today on the community level and our, our work around the community, but we do have a team uh, that is also focused on uh, the individual level uh, member data and, and you know how we use it and, and our solutions and outreach there. Um, as well as interventions. And so technology uh, is absolutely a part of that, uh, given it's 2023 and I, I know uh, we, we all are leveraging technology. Um, you know, the research and uh, what we know about Medicaid members and, and how they use technology um, is, is, you know, key in helping us understand how we develop our interventions using the data. So yes, we are absolutely using the data to do member uh, interventions as well, leveraging technology. That'll be for another session since uh, I don't want to open a can of worms with 10 minutes left. So we'll, we'll we can do we can do a whole session. other hour on that. Yes, yes, yes sure. Um, lots of questions about redetermination. I might take a couple of them just in, in rapid succession. So one of the questions was, um, given the early numbers that we're seeing, particularly out of some states like Florida and Arkansas, where there's been a significant uh, drop in enrollment as a result of uh, the redetermination process kicking off, are we working with state uh, Medicaid agencies directly to address that or working with plans. Uh, right now, today, we're working more on the plan side. It's not to say that we couldn't do it at the state level, but our focus has really been on taking our data um, and analytic um, approaches and being able to empower our plan partners to use that to understand, you know, which of their members are going to be most likely impacted by this process and how do they prioritize the investments that they're making to try and um, ensure that their members that are still eligible are able to retain their coverage. So not to say that we couldn't work with a state like Florida, um, but to say that right now we're focused on supporting our plan partners around this. The other piece, um, there's a question about sort of how are we seeing um, plans start to use this? It really is about optimizing the investments that you're making in supporting members through this process. So whether those are you know, people that are picking up the phone and making calls, make sure you're calling the right number, make sure you understand sort of the needs of that member and you can provide the most effective support. The other piece is given just the speed at which all of this is happening, we know that you're likely not going to be able to reach everyone during their redetermination period. And so being able to pr prioritize proactively who you focus on will allow you to make sure that your resources and your team are able to reach the members who are most likely to need support through this process. So that's been our focus to date. 
Elizabeth, I know we only have a few minutes left. I, I can't let you go without asking this great um, magic wand question that someone asked, which is if you had a magic wand, what would you change in either data or partnerships or policy that would enable you to achieve either your desired outcomes or expand your, your reach and impact with all this work? So would love to hear your thoughts on that. Gosh. Um... <laughs> Since I've been, um, and you know, my background, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and so I've been in this this space for for quite some time. And um, I would just say, what I would change is just that we keep evolving. Um, you know, what we were doing five years ago is very different than what we're doing today. Um, our our data continues to get better. Um, our, our partnerships and um, collaboration in the community, um, especially as we're looking, I know one uh, question, you know, was about reimbursement for services as we continue to look at more um, community supports and in lieu of services, um, I, you know, I would just say that we keep evolving collectively um, and partnering uh, to continue improving. And just as a testament to the approach um, that you're taking in the team that you've built, I will say that your ability to both innovate and iterate is really inspiring to us here at Socially Determined and to a lot of the other organizations that we're working with, just that ability to sort of take in data, to make more informed decisions, to act quickly, which is not always easy, candidly, in big organizations. Um, and so being able to infuse that into the work that you're doing, both internally and with your community partners, is, is really commendable. So kudos to you and the team for that. Thank you. Um, with that said, I know we're approaching the top of the hour, so I will turn it back over to Eric to close us out with any final remarks or housekeeping items. Great. Thank you so much for that incredibly informative and insightful presentation. Obviously, SDOH is such a pertinent topic in the issue. We, we appreciate you both taking some time to share what your teams are doing in the space. Um, we at MHBA think it's such a pertinent issue. We are actually basing one of our breakout session tracks at our annual conference this October completely around SDOH. So it's always great to hear what our, what our members and partners are doing in the space. Um, as a reminder, you can follow up directly with the socially determined team if you have any questions, you know, any more questions following this presentation. I think we set a record today for the amount of questions our, our presenters answered today. So thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your participation. This session has been amazing. Uh, you will also be able to find a recording of the session on MHPA's YouTube channel if you wish to revisit it in the future. With that, I would like to thank Ashley, Elizabeth, and the entire Socially Determined team once again for putting together today's session. And we'll go ahead and close out. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.